The ancient kingdom of Wessex is riddled with folklore and legend. Alongside those roots, more modern stories such as the flight of the Prince of Wales from Cromwell's army and the sinking of King Henry's flagship, the Mary Rose, create the richest of royal tapestries. In this programme, we also visit one of the most famous ancient sites of civilization, Stonehenge, examine Salisbury's regal past, unearth the secret of Winchester's Great Hall and explore the defender of the Empire's south coast, Portsmouth, where we join Her Majesty's Yacht Britannia for its final voyage. The truth is that this whole area is steeped in myth, legend and prehistoric mysteries, the most famous of which is Stonehenge. Stonehenge is thought to date from anything between 4000 to 1000 BC. It's not the only stone or wooden circle in the area, but the awesome size of these stone blocks make it unique. The blue stones were probably transported from Wales and erected by hand, and the Saracen stones from the Marlborough Plains. Such an awesome undertaking can't fail to impress, and right up to the modern day it has made us wonder both about our past and where we are going. Even the King of England spent a day here, contemplating his future and the fate of his country. When on the run from Cromwell's army in 1651, the Prince of Wales paused here while waiting for a safe opportunity to slip out of the country, so that one day he could return as King Charles II. Way before that though, some settlements gradually became isolated forts, such as Old Sarum. No one knows quite why prehistoric man settled here. Salisbury Plain must have been pretty inhospitable, even then. The Romans built a garrison nearby, but even they didn't settle here in any numbers. Indeed, it was Saxon times before the first large settlement was built here. That was at Wilton, and it developed because of the trade routes. Wilton was on the key crossing over the Nadder and Wiley rivers, and it was growing as a commercial centre. Wilton claims not only to have given its name to the county of Wiltshire, but also to have been the ancient capital of Wessex. Alfred encountered the Danes in 871 near here, and during the battle, the town was burnt to the ground, but Wilton later became one of Alfred's fortified boroughs in his continuing campaign against the invaders. However, his successful pact with the Danes was shattered by Ethelred the Unready in 1002. Unready quite literally means lacking common sense, which is still rather generous. Having failed in his attempts to buy out the Danish settlers, the king decided to murder them all. On St. Bryce's Day, November the 13th, he arranged for one of the Danish settlements to be completely massacred. Not surprisingly, the Danes wanted revenge. The following year, they practically destroyed Wessex, including Wilton. Later, during the Middle Ages, the wool trade was extremely important in Wiltshire, but Wilton only had mediocre weaving skills. The Earl of Pembroke wanted to encourage the arts and craft in the 1730s and 40s, and was convinced that the way ahead was through the encouragement of high technical skills allied to the spread of the Industrial Revolution. In France at the time, much to his annoyance, they had state-of-the-art methods of weaving that were the envy of Europe. Louis XV wanted to prevent any of his skilled craftsmen from working for anyone else, so he put a ban on them from leaving the country. But that didn't stop Pembroke, who smuggled two of the top weavers out of France by hiding them in wine barrels and shipping them to Wilton. In 1742, the main Wilton weave was invented. A factory developed and a patent applied for, 
which also included furnishing fabrics. When a fire destroyed the Axminster carpet factory down in Devon, Wilton took over the remains, looms and designs. They also took workers and with them developed the carpets, which made them famous around the world. Appropriately enough, all the carpets in Wilton House are Wilton's, although most are now copies of the originals. However, in the famous double cube room, which has been visited by virtually every British monarch since Charles I, there is still an original Wilton carpet that is nearly 200 years old and still looks beautiful. Long before places like Wilton House were built, the Crown had its own lodgings in the vicinity of Salisbury. Clarendon Palace was originally a summer hunting lodge used by William the Conqueror and was possibly the only unfortified palace of the Norman kings. It was gradually transformed into a summer palace by Henry II and then Henry III, so that by 1189, Clarendon had been promoted to one of the major palaces of England. Sadly, there is only this flint wall left, but Clarendon has left its mark on British history. It's here that two great meetings take place that resulted in significant legislation and events of national significance. The first is 1164, which is the Constitutions of Clarendon. That was the first confrontation between Henry II and that turbulent priest, Thomas Becket. Here, they had their first confrontation over papal power. And some of the 19th century owners of Clarendon, um, Sir Frederick Harvey Bathurst in 1844, erected a tablet over there which claimed that Henry II as the defender of the church in England against papal power as promoted by Becket. Here at Clarendon sowed the first seeds which grew into the English Reformation of the 16th century. The second major event at Clarendon also had long-lasting ramifications. 1166, the Assize of Clarendon here gives some impression of the scale. Here a parliament or a group of magnates meets and they set in train the Assize of Clarendon which established for the first time the um, notion of trial by jury and jury uh, representation in every ville and hamlet of the land. Clarendon was not the only royal palace near Salisbury. The Normans built another palace which William the Conqueror used along with a cathedral in the ancient fortified town of Old Sarum. Its name comes from the Anglo-Saxon meaning the town of battle and it's most apt. It's a natural stronghold, probably fortified during the early Iron Age, and was not only the scene of countless skirmishes between rival tribes seeking control, but also between the church and the crown. The first Norman bishop was Osmond, thought by some to be William the Conqueror's son. Osmond is credited with laying down the basic governing rules for cathedrals. The inner bailey was created in the reign of William the Conqueror, and he built, first of all, his castle and palace in the inner bailey. And when Bishop Osmond was elected by him to come to Sarum, the cathedral was actually started and that's in the outer bailey. So the clergy were outside and the garrison and the king were actually inside. When Osmond was here, he was also Chancellor of all England. So at this point we have the, the clergy and um, the monarchy actually working hand in hand as a power base. And at this stage in, in the history of Sarum, we're pretty sure that really most of England was actually ruled from here and Clarendon Palace. It was probably one of the most important places. At the same time as Osmond, a young priest called Roger became the steward of Prince Henry, the youngest son of William the Conqueror. When Henry was crowned in 1100, he made Roger his chancellor and then bishop of Sarum. Roger held enormous power and even represented the king when he was abroad. 
He also developed an efficient method of auditing the royal accounts by using counters on a checkered cloth, hence the name of the government department, the Exchequer. Such power brought distrust, though, and when Roger was suspected of supporting Matilda against King Stephen, he was arrested and forced to surrender all his property and riches. Soon after, Bishop Roger died, and the castle and city began to fall into decline. To make matters worse, Henry II showed a preference for the palace at Clarendon. Old Sarum was a bleak and windswept place. There were constant water shortages, and the clergy complained that the wind howled so loudly they couldn't hear themselves sing. In 1194, Bishop Richard Paul got permission from Richard I to build a new settlement in the valley below. There is a story that the new site was marked by the firing of an arrow from Old Sarum, and that where it landed was where they would build. Since the new site is some two miles away, it seems unlikely, although romantic. Old Sarum, like Wilton and Clarendon, soon fell into decline. By 1377, there were only ten poll tax payers. By 1540, there was not one house standing. However, Old Sarum survived in name amazingly as one of the most infamous rotten boroughs, returning two MPs, including the Prime Minister, William Pitt, despite the fact there were no voters. The Reform Act removed this anomaly in 1832. With its new bridge built and the trade route established, Salisbury quickly prospered in its new location. It was the heart of the cloth industry and it produced a new class of wealthy citizens. Just as Old Sarum had been important to the Crown, Salisbury now took on that role. And just about every monarch has visited the city at some time or another, although not always with the happiest of outcomes. Richard III visited Salisbury with his kingdom in crisis, and the need to imprison his former ally, the Duke of Buckingham, foremost in his mind. Widely reputed to have arranged the murder of the princes in the Tower, Richard is said to have plotted their deaths with the Duke of Buckingham. Now he had to arrest his former co-conspirator with all haste. Firstly, the ambitious Buckingham sided against him as the country was divided by the War of the Roses. And secondly, Buckingham clearly knew far too much about the King's past. Buckingham was captured and brought to Salisbury where Richard III was staying. In spite of pleas for mercy, Richard ordered his execution. In the courtyard of the Blue Boar, Buckingham was beheaded the following day. His severed head was carried through the streets of Salisbury to show the king. It was the 2nd of November, All Souls Day, and a Sunday. And it's very unusual for executions to take place on a Sunday. But I think um, Richard III was so uh, frightened of this man that he just wanted him out of the way as quickly as possible. And of course his ghost now haunts the site of the Blue Boar Inn, which of course is uh, Debenhams. Uh, and the ghost is particularly active around November, December time, which is the anniversary of the execution. Since the days of Henry VI, visiting royalty would stay here at Bishop's Palace. Situated within the cathedral's close, it was begun by Bishop Paul when he founded the city, and it reflects the power of the church at that time. It is said that here in the antechapel, James II suffered his famous nosebleed. William of Orange had landed at Brixham in Devon, having been invited by Parliament to overthrow the Roman Catholic James. The King arrived in Salisbury on his way to joining his army at Warminster, but he was unaware that some of his generals, including Churchill, later the Duke of Marlborough, were plotting against him. Their plan was to invite the king to inspect his troops, seize him and hand him over to the Dutch before any battle could take place. On the morning King James was due to leave, the cathedral chaplain found some Catholic priests preparing to say mass in the chapel. The chaplain was most perturbed and insisted the king ask the Catholics to leave. No sooner had the priests left than the king developed a terrible nosebleed. As a result of the row over whether he could attend a Mass or not, the King felt it necessary to stay in bed for three days, in the room that is now used as the school sanatorium. In those three days, Churchill and the other generals changed sides. 
King James was isolated. He had no choice but to flee from here to Rochester and then into exile. Because of his nosebleed, at least the king managed to escape almost certain capture. Salisbury and the Cathedral Close were also involved in another royal escape by Charles II. The king was passed from one loyal household to another until he reached Heel House near Stonehenge, where plans had to be made for the final stage of his journey. He spent six nights here before riding to Shoreham, where he planned to take the boat to France. He went to the house anonymously but was instantly recognised by the lady of the house, a Mrs Hyde, who suggested a plan to keep him safe. She felt that none of the household that had seen him could be trusted. She instructed the king to ride off on horse the next morning as if leaving, and then, under the cover of darkness, return to the house to hide until the news came that his ship was ready. So the king and his aides set off and went as far as Stonehenge, where they stayed and, in his own words, looked upon the stones, spending the whole day there before returning to Heel House at the appointed time. The king then stayed alone in the hiding place for the next five days before setting off for the coast. When he returned, it was as king. Five years later, in 1660, the plague struck. Charles II left London to avoid the scourge of the disease. Remembering their help before, he brought the whole court to Salisbury and came to stay here at Malmesbury House. Malmesbury House lies within Salisbury's elaborate grid system, which was one part of the grand design by the founder of the city, Bishop Richard Paul. However, it is the cathedral for which Bishop Paul is best known. It is amongst the largest in the country, and with the exception of St Paul's in London, is the only one to be built almost entirely to the design of one man, with only the west front and the spire being added later. Henry III supported the project and gave as much timber as was necessary from the forests of Clarendon to build a roof for the cathedral. The cathedral's sheer dominance of the city of Salisbury and the surrounding countryside was meant as a statement both of the wealth of the area and the power of the church. William Longsby, the illegitimate son of Henry II, as the Earl of Salisbury, was present, along with his wife, at the laying of the foundation stone of the cathedral in 1220. A few years later, he was rumoured to be lost at sea. His wife Ella, in his absence, was approached by a number of suitors for her hand in marriage. Most persistent of the suitors was one Hugh de Berg. Well, a few months later, William returned and there was great rejoicing. But of course Ella told him about the suitors, told him about Hugh de Berg, and William was very angry and went to the king and complained. And the king said, well, no, you must settle this argument now. Um, and Hugh de Berg gave a great banquet up at Old Sarum for the safe return of William. And just a few days after the banquet, the very healthy William dropped down dead. Well, at the time, nobody seems to have been terribly suspicious, and they came and buried William down here in the east end of the cathedral, which had just been completed. There were those, though, who suggested that perhaps the peace offering was quite literally a poison chalice. And there may be some truth in the tale, too, because when the architect Wyatt uncovered Longspee's tomb many centuries later, he found a dead rat in the skull which had died of arsenic poisoning. The cathedral is rightly regarded as one of the most beautiful in the country. The spire is the tallest in England, rising 404 feet above the water meadows, and it was once the tallest building in the known world and is still the highest surviving medieval spire in this country today. There is something mesmerising about the cathedral and its spire. It's a construction so grand that it totally dominates its surroundings. 
Across Wiltshire to Hampshire in the south lies Portsmouth, a naval town that also dominates its surroundings, as the base of the Monarch's fleet. The story of Portsmouth started at the top of the harbour in Portchester, which has been a fortified site since Roman times. In the early 12th century, Henry I built a keep in the corner of the Roman fortress. It was to be a base for Henry and his family when travelling backwards and forwards to France. So why didn't the town of Portsmouth develop at Portchester? Well, I am quite convinced that the town of Portsmouth would have developed here, round the fortress here at Portchester, but for the fact that in the late 12th century the harbour began to silt up and it became increasingly difficult to get large boats up the harbour. The new town was founded in 1180, literally at the port's mouth, by a Frenchman, Jean de Guisor, and it could still be French if it wasn't for the crown. We're, we're into the reign of Richard I now, and Richard went on crusade to the Holy Land. He was captured on his way back to England. While Richard was in prison, you know, you're then that business, you know, the cats away and the mice will play, his brother, John, Prince John, raised the flag of rebellion here in England, and the King of France invaded the Duchy of Normandy. What were you going to do here in England? Did you back Prince John? Would you, you hold on in the hope that Richard would return? John de Gisor was one of those people who backed Prince John. Well, we know Richard returned. And uh, all those people who'd backed Prince John had their lands confiscated. And the, the new town of Portsmouth, the harbour mouth, was confiscated. It accrued to the Crown. They received their first royal charter in May 1194. So the Crown gained direct control of the new town and the harbour of Portsmouth, as well as a new base for expeditions across the Channel. It remained like this for nearly 300 years until Henry VII made a major innovation. In 1495, Henry VII had the first dry dock built. It was to change the status of Portsmouth forever. The dry dock changed Portsmouth from a harbour to a dockyard. The dockyard enabled Henry and his successors to build more, larger and better armed ships. His son Henry VIII dramatically increased his fleet from five ships to 55. Possibly the most famous ship of the day was the Mary Rose. She was built when King Henry came to the throne in 1509. She was highly successful throughout his reign until disaster struck in 1545. The French had landed on the Isle of Wight. Henry came to South Sea Castle to watch his fleet leave Portsmouth and engage the French force in the Solent. At the head of the English fleet was his pride and joy, the Mary Rose. From his vantage point on the top of South Sea Castle, Henry had a commanding view of the impending battle. As he stood here, right before his very eyes, just out there to the left of the fort, one of the greatest naval tragedies in history was about to unfold. One uh, account from a Fleming, one of the survivors, said something like that uh, they'd fired the guns on one side and were turning to fire the guns on the other side and they'd failed to close the gun ports. And I think perhaps a combination of a, a tilt in the wind and the gun ports being opened would have caused the great maritime disaster of the time. The Mary Rose sank within a matter of minutes with up to 700 hands lost. The discovery and raising of the Mary Rose provides us with a unique glimpse of maritime life in Portsmouth during Henry VIII's reign. These are some of the bronze guns that were recovered from the Mary Rose, and each one of them is ornately decorated with variations of royal devices, coat of arms, and even Henry VIII's name. Maritime archaeologist Chris Dobbs was one of the divers who, along with Prince Charles, went down to the seabed in the Solent to bring up some of the relics of life on board. 
as well as the, the, the bronze guns, which are uh, the, the sort of major firepower, we've also got um, some longbows, which were, uh, again, a, a fantastic thing to have found because so few were, had ever been found before. And I remember when the first one was brought up, there was a fantastic fuss about it because we'd found a longbow and so on. But they're, they're in fantastic condition, um, made of yew and really beautiful. And they've got small marks, you can just see here, which are called the draw marks, and that's where the arrow would have been placed to, to when they do the longbows. But um, as well as all the, these examples of ordnance, we then have a complete collection, a, a cross-section of life on board the ship. And, and that's really the value of the Mary Rose collection. This was actually one of the medicine jars in the barber surgeon's uh, cabin. We actually found his chest, his whole toolkit of equipment. And you could actually still smell the, the menthol, like a, a Vicks inhaler. In the, in the jars when they came up. And that sort of find, you know, really brings home the Tudor life that we're studying. The, the great thing about underwater archaeology is we get all the organic artifacts. We've got the, the wooden objects, the leather objects, very nice combs. And here's a, these are some tiny objects, which are my favourites at the moment. They're called aglets. And they're actually the little things that you have on the ends of your laces. So I've got plastic ones on my, my, my shoes, but they had these little copper alloy ones. Uh, in Tudor times, and uh, that sort of insight into Tudor life I find just fascinating. Towards the end of the 16th century, it was Spain rather than France, though, who posed the greater threat, most visibly illustrated by the Armada. Portsmouth became increasingly important to England. As the primary launching point for our fleets and therefore essential to our defence, it had to be secure. These forts around the Solent were thrown up by Henry VIII, but others, like the round tower guarding the harbour entrance, are much older. Built originally by Henry V, it was later modernised by Elizabeth I. To pay for this and other work to the South Coast defences, Elizabeth instituted the first national lottery. The draw took two years, but then the prizes were spectacular. £4,700 for the winning ticket, that's a million pounds in today's terms, and tapestry and linen if you got, say, five numbers right. Perhaps the most personal of all the associations between the Crown and Portsmouth came immediately after the Civil War. When Charles II married Catherine of Braganza in 1662, he chose to have the wedding here at Domus Day. Unfortunately, he was extremely late for the ceremony, and the locals took pity on his bride and offered her a drink. Only all they had was ale, which she thought was quite disgusting. So she asked for some tea to be brought from her royal barge, and, as far as we know, this is the first time tea is mentioned in English history, and quite possibly the first time it was drunk within these shores. The innovations during Charles's reign didn't stop there. He was instrumental in the reorganisation of the navy. His state barge still exists, and is on display in Portsmouth's Naval Museum. Well, this barge is the oldest royal barge in existence. Um, he would have used it on his visits to the fleet, which he often did, because he was uh, very interested in the affairs of his navy. In the stern of the, the barge is um, a picture of Britannia, a very early picture, because Britannia became the symbol for Britain around that time. And the legend is that the model for it was one of Charles's mistresses. So here on his barge is a picture of one of his mistresses. The barge's other great claim to fame is that it was used during the funeral of Lord Nelson in January 1806. He'd lain in state at uh, the Painted Hall in Greenwich, and he was rowed in great state up the River Thames in a huge and glorious river procession with barges everywhere. Uh, and this is the barge in which the body actually lay. In those, on that day, it didn't look quite as colourful as it does now. It's covered in black with a great big black canopy. Uh, but the, bar, the body actually lay on the seats there in the stern. Charles really was the first king to take an active interest in the affairs of the Royal Navy. Henry VIII had done quite a bit, but Charles was the one that really made it part of his policy. Um, and thanks to that great man, Samuel Pepys, who was a personal friend of the king's indeed, and a great administrator, the navy really, during Charles's reign, began to become a standing force with proper organisation, proper pay, proper victualling, which before had been rather hand-to-mouth. That force needed supplying with raw materials. During the next century, Portsmouth started to develop at a great pace. It was during the reign of George III, towards the end of the 18th century, that the town and royal dockyard experienced their most significant growth. 
With Britain's rise in terms of trade, the shipping routes around the globe needed protection. It was the golden age of sail. The Royal Navy's ships needed to be bigger and more powerful, so the dockyards had to be made larger and more efficient. Prior to 1760s, most of the buildings were made of wood. It was only natural because we had lots of shipwrights, lots of captured French and Spanish ships, all laying in the harbour rotting, and it was only sensible to convert those ships into timber. So it, it was a very economical process, really. After the great fires of the um, 1760s, we find that most of the buildings start to change from being of wood construction to brick, which is a testimony, really, to that decision today, because when we look around, we see that most of the buildings that we have here are from that period. The clock was really one of the centre timepieces of the whole community. When the, when the clock struck, everybody got up, people went to work, shops opened, and the whole community then came alive. So it was a, a very much an important part of life. If you look around the dockyard, um, we're very much unlike most other industries in the country. In the, if you look around, we have a, our own church, our own mortuary, uh, the school, uh, dwelling houses, a fire station, a police department inside. So it really is a community within a community. So what were the key elements of the dockyard? Well, it's got to be the dry docks. That's where we get our name, dockyard. It was a place full of dry docks. In fact, we still have the, the oldest stone dry dock in the world, number five dock. And it was these docks that gave the Navy the ability to come in quickly, have their uh, hulls repaired and proceed to, to sea again almost without uh, hindrance. That was the key thing of the dockyard. There is probably no ship more closely identified with the might of the Royal Navy than HMS Victory. Nelson's flagship may have been launched over 200 years ago, but she's still in commission today. Colour party, ho! Colours, sir! Make it so! What is so unique about Victory? She is the only surviving ship from Trafalgar. She is the epitome of the Royal Navy. Um, she stands very much on her own as the typical kind of wooden walls that we use to defend this country. She had an immense amount of gun power. Um, you could call this the equivalent of a modern Trident submarine. So what were the living conditions like on board? The crew on here, she was short-handed at Trafalgar. She actually had 821 men. Most of the seamen actually lived on the lower gun deck, which was quite a horrendous place. And at meal times, there would be some 584 men eating down there. So you can imagine in this cramped, dark area, because the gun ports were shut, there will be the stale smell of bodies. Uh, there were some animals kept in the, in, in the manger for it. And the conditions will be very damp all the time because of the salt sea atmosphere and condensation running down the sides of the ship all the time. So these men were in damp clothing, etc., all the time. When you see the tables on Victory's lower gun deck, the, the, we only see some of them. Um, there would have actually been somewhere in the region of 80 tables set up at dinner time to ensure that all the men mess together. And, of course, the men would sit at tables and they had wooden bowls and square plates and it is the square plates that we see here is where the expression um, three square meals a day actually comes from. And what about Nelson himself? I mean, what sort of figure was he? Nelson always treated his men well. He knew that to get the best out of people, you have to look after people. The point that before the battle, he walked around all the decks and talked with everybody just to give them that final sort of, yes, we're OK here, Nelson has sort of spoken with me and it gives you that sort of um, feeling that you're going to do well that day. And he was like that with his captains too. He made friends with everybody. And it's keeping this friendship or his band of brothers that uh, gave us this advantage of Trafalgar. Trafalgar's great decisiveness comes from the fact that it was so complete. 
the French and Spanish fleet of 33 ships was almost wiped out. 18 were captured, one blew up, four more were captured a few days later. The rest struggled back into Cadiz very badly damaged. So it was a massive blow to the naval power of France and Spain. It was also a great uh, psychological blow because it, it wiped out any chance of invasion. Um, and it did indeed usher in a period where there were no more great fleet actions for the rest of the war, and the war lasted 10 years. But such a decisive victory had its price. If there is one place that everyone who comes to Portsmouth has to visit, it's here where Nelson fell. And on Trafalgar Day, every sailor on board Victory wears a very special memorial to Lord Nelson. On their cap you will see a laurel leaf. This stems from a visit Queen Victoria made to this ship in 1844 on Trafalgar Day. A wreath was laid on the deck for Lord Nelson, and the Queen stepped forward. Bending down, she plucked a leaf to keep as a tribute to one of Britain's greatest heroes. He was felled by a single shot from a French sniper high up in the rigging of the enemy ship Redoutable. It may seem rather macabre, but the actual bullet that killed him having been presented by the ship's surgeon to King William IV, has been kept at Windsor Castle ever since. Britain's mastery of the sea was to remain virtually unchallenged until 1914, but the speed of change during the same period was extraordinary. This is Fort Nelson, part of a circle of forts known as Palmerston's Folly, and it's typical of the type of building and technical innovation that went into the defence of Portsmouth. Hey! 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 Although the forts have a commanding view of the harbour, their interlocking cannon fire, developed in the 19th century, was designed to defend an attack from land side. As it turned out, Portsmouth was neither attacked nor invaded in Victorian times. The sheer strength of the town, along with innovative ships like this one, Warrior, was deterrent enough. Warrior's stream-driven screw propeller, combined with sails, gave her a top speed of 18 knots. Together with her armament of breech-loading guns, this was enough to keep her enemies in port. The change from sail to steam was significant. The, the revolution that the Navy went through during the 19th century was one of the greatest technological revolutions in history. The best way of thinking of it is if a sailor in Drake's Navy in the 1500s had come on board the Victory 300 years later, he would have felt fairly at home. He, he would have probably taken about a week to settle down, but he would have known what to do. A sailor from the Victory going on board a ship of 1905 just 100 years later would have been totally lost. All Everything he knew would have changed. The propulsion from sail to steam, the guns from small 24-pounder muzzle-loading guns to huge breech-loading guns. The ships would be going at frightening speeds of 20 knots or something like that. So that's a measure of it. And it all happened here. The real link with the Navy and the Royal Family comes in the 19th century, and it starts with Queen Victoria sending her second son, Alfred, to sea as a career. And he rose to be a full admiral and, and commanded the reserves before he was appointed Duke of Saxe Coburg and there. That inspired um, the Lord, uh, Prince Louis of Battenberg, Lord Mountbatten's father, who was another great sailor. And really the tradition began of, of royal, members of the Royal Family serving in the Navy almost as a training. By far the most visible recent link between Sovereign and the Royal Navy has to be Her Majesty's yacht, Britannia. Wherever she went, Sydney, Auckland, Vancouver and even here at Cowes, she evoked enormous affection and attracted huge flotillas of small boats. Britannia served the Queen from 1954 and she is the first royal yacht to have been an ocean-going palace providing a means of travel as well as accommodation on the seas. Traditionally, she has supported the sovereign 
and that really has been the first and, and most significant part of our task. But of course, as times have changed and there have become more pressures on the Royal Program, air travel, the Royal Yacht has not really been able to sustain a full worldwide program because simply, in the Queen's case, she has been required to be in many places too quickly. That particular role, uh, which in the 50s and the 60s became uh, a very dominant part, became less towards the end of the 70s uh, and by the 80s and now into the 90s. Uh, we've seen the dual role appear, which is the commercial use of Britannia in support of the monarch, but obviously, of course, in support of the country as a whole. And it's that second role now that fills some of the gap that was left. But I think overall, Britannia throughout her life has had this terrific usage. Statistically, she has traveled once around the world in every year of her commission. Every time we go into Portsmouth, there's a great welcome for us. And I know always amongst them are large numbers of the families as well as uh, people around who are watching this great ship coming back into her, her home port. At least once a year during its life, Her Majesty embarked on Britannia in Portsmouth and took the opportunity to meet the families of the sailors of the Royal Yacht. Britannia, as the royal yacht for over 40 years, was the symbol of Britain as a maritime nation, maintaining our strong naval and seafaring tradition. However, now this glorious chapter in the story of the Crown, the Royal Navy in Portsmouth, has drawn to a close. For 1997 was Britannia's final year serving Queen Elizabeth II. However, the story of this royal kingdom is one of continual change and renewal. It is a story that in this part of the country goes back over two millennia. The site of Winchester has always been close to a ford across the river Itchen. It was used by the Celts 2,000 years ago. The Romans took over the site, and then it was abandoned for a time before the Saxons re-established it as Wintoncester in the 7th century. What happened next was to turn Winchester from being just another Saxon town in Wessex into the most important city in England for nearly four centuries. Alfred the Great was principally responsible for Winchester's change in fortunes, yet when he succeeded as King of Wessex in 871, it couldn't have been at a more difficult moment. England was experiencing the might of a Danish invasion force. One by one, each of the ancient kingdoms of Northumbria, Mercia, East Anglia and Wessex were being defeated. After Mercia fell in 874, Wessex was the only kingdom left, and when the Danes attacked four years later, they nearly won. Alfred was forced to retreat to the safety of Athenae, deep in the Somerset marshes. From there, Alfred plotted his revenge and eventual victory. The Danes did not attack Wessex again for another 14 years, but this time, Alfred was ready. His defences, as well as his forces, were well organised, and within four years, the Danes finally withdrew. During those periods of relative peace, Wessex, and in particular Winchester, prospered.
for it was here that Alfred established a place of government, worship and learning. Winchester became the administrative and financial centre for Alfred's and his successor's kingdom. This is where the coins were minted, records kept, and the kings of Wessex held court. Now, little evidence remains from the Saxon era, but many of the functions continued long after the age of the Saxon kings. The Great Hall, for instance, is all that remains of a major castle, originally started by the Normans, but massively added to by Henry III. It was for a long time the seat of government and the official royal residence in Winchester. This was the home of the Treasury and the Exchequer, which provided the kings with their financial means to govern. The first full record of land ownership and wealth, compiled for William the Conqueror, known as the Doomsday Book, was kept here. The Great Hall was still being used in its governmental role in the 1300s, when the then kings held Parliament here. When a fire in 1302 caused widespread damage to the old castle, the Bishop's Palace at Wolvesey became the preferred royal residence in Winchester. Henri de Blois, Bishop of Winchester, grandson of William the Conqueror, in the early 12th century, there was a lot of civil strife. And so people lost their homes, their families, their jobs. And so the place was founded for 13 poor men. I think possibly the 13 because of Christ and the 12 apostles. So who is entitled to become a brother here? Uh, anyone who applies. Uh, some similar places in other parts of the country, there's a residential qualification. For instance, you have had to have been born in the town or have lived there for a number of years. But here there's no restriction on that store. You simply apply. Uh, you come for a 48-hour visit so that you can case the joint, as it were, and the people here can see you. And our life is really what we wish to make it. The only obligation is to go to chapel at 10 o'clock each weekday morning for matins, and then the rest of the time we're, we're completely free. There are two orders of St. Cross. The order of the brothers of André de Blois dress in black. Those in purple belong to a more recent order. In the 15th century, like this year, we're commemorating the 550th anniversary of the founding by another Bishop of Winchester, Cardinal Henry Beaufort, and he was also Chancellor of England. He was much more powerful than the king. In fact, at one point, he took the royal crown at pawn to lend money to the, to the king. So there. Um, and uh, he was surrounded, by, as chancellor, by what we could call now higher civil servants, you know, the Sir Humphreys, I suppose. And he wanted them to live in that setting in their last years, because the hall, chapel, and the buildings are just like a, an Oxbridge College. A token sum of money is still doled out each week as a reminder of the welfare the brothers have received for 700 years. It is no accident that the most dominating feature in Winchester is the cathedral. There has been a church or minster on this site since the 7th century, when the early Wessex kings realised the importance of linking government with God. The outline of the Old Minster, which existed at the time of Alfred the Great, has been marked out alongside the present cathedral. By the time of Alfred, Winchester's Minster had enjoyed cathedral status for more than 200 years. This was the religious heart of the kingdom and remained so until Edward the Confessor, the last king to be crowned here. The most important religious ceremony for any sovereign in Britain is the coronation. Amazingly, Queen Elizabeth II's coronation service in 1953 was much the same as Edward the Confessor's in 1051, yet the origins of the service are even older. Many of the rites and elements were created by Archbishop Dunstan when he crowned King Edgar some 80 years before Edward. When Dunstan drafted the coronation, he wanted basically to achieve five things. To start with, he had the shout of recognition. And right at the beginning of the service, the Archbishop would say, here is this man, do you accept him? And there would have been a great cheer, which was the recognition that he was the man. But they wanted, before they gave him all the power he needed, to ensure that he was controlled, to 
to do that, they had the oath. And then the king, having made his oath to the people, would prepare himself for the greatest gift the church could give, which was the unction. To do that, he prostrated himself on the ground. He was, to some extent, left, as, as it were, for dead. And he would then rise up, dressed as simply as he could in the robes of a Byzantine peasant, ready for being elevated to this high point of, of, of office. Then he would be anointed. At this point, the church has given him everything they possibly can. And on behalf of the state, the archbishop then gave to the king the symbols of his authority. This was the fourth part, the investiture. But before the investiture began, they sang the anthem, Zadok the priest. Now, Dunstan was a clever man. He chose this part of theology quite sensibly because he wanted to make sure that everyone remembered it was a priest who made the king. So after the investiture of crown, rod of state, and sword of power, he would then be entitled to ask for the one thing the king needs, and that was homage in return. And then all his peers and nobles and the church were ready to do homage to him. Edgar fulfilled Alfred's dream by uniting the whole kingdom of England and creating one peaceful nation. His coronation was symbolic of this achievement and more, for he changed the meaning of loyalty to the crown. No longer was it a pagan tribal instinct, but he made it a Christian obligation and introduced for the first time the idea of national patriotism. It was during Edgar's reign that Old Minster was reformed to a monastery known as St. Swithin's Priory. Switham was the bishop in the time of Alfred's father and grandfather and probably played a significant role supporting the House of Wessex. He is credited with rebuilding the bridge over the Itchen and performing a miracle. He met a woman who had dropped and broken her basket of eggs, yet when he picked it up and gave it back to her, not a single egg was broken. However, the saint is probably best known for his association with the weather, and this stems from the story that he asked to be buried in a humble tomb outside Old Minster. But in July 971, they exhumed his body and ceremonially brought him inside the Minster, at which point a dreadful storm occurred, and ever since, legend says that if it rains on St. Swithin's Day, it will rain for the next 40. Winchester Cathedral is a royal burial site, and as such, it avoided the worst excesses of the Reformation under Henry VIII. However, it did not escape entirely. At three o'clock one morning in September 1538, one of Henry's arch henchmen, Thomas Radsley, led a small band who smashed St. Swithin's shrine and removed his bones in case they became the cause of veneration. From this moment, the saint's bones have never been seen again. Winchester Cathedral was actually the cause of another scene of destruction. The present cathedral was largely built by the Normans, yet before construction could begin, the Bishop Walkland couldn't agree with the King, William I, how much timber was required. The bishop persuaded the king to let him take as much timber from the nearby royal hunting forest as Hampage as he could cut in four days. He then amassed an army of carpenters and stripped the forest bare. He left just one tree, the Gospel Oak as it's known, because this is the place, it was said, that the Gospel was first read in Wessex. The king was understandably furious and it's thought Walklin was forced to do penance in sackcloth before he was forgiven. It's also a very good reason why, just a few miles to the south, William the Conqueror established a new forest. 
It was in this new forest that William's unpopular son, William Rufus, was shot while hunting. The rest of the hunting party fled and left the body in the middle of the forest. Prince Henry, Rufus's younger brother, also fled but straight to Winchester and seized control of the treasury and the exchequer, and within three days was crowned king. Eventually, Rufus's body was also brought to Winchester. Under the cover of darkness, it was carried into the cathedral, and to the sounds of revelry celebrating Henry I's succession outside, they buried William II inside. The fact that this essentially Norman construction is still standing is something of a surprise, for it's built over a former marsh, and even now, during wintertime, the water table rises so high as to flood the crypt. At the beginning of the century, though, parts of the cathedral seemed in danger of collapsing and needed to be underpinned. A deep-sea diver, William Walker, was called in and by hand replaced the raft of beach logs with bags of cement concrete. It took him six years to complete the work, and King George V and Queen Mary attended the service of thanksgiving for the workers, and especially the diver, who saved the cathedral. Along with government and worship, the third element of Alfred the Great's foundation in Winchester was a place of learning. His patronage of literature and his personal involvement with the translation of Latin books and texts into English are further examples of this remarkable king's many talents. It isn't just the translation of books, but the illumination of his works that is so special. Some of the best examples are invariably Bibles, and this Winchester Bible, albeit 12th century, is a perfect specimen of the local style of illumination. There was always a sense of partnership between the crown and the people under God. In these illuminations, the crown, through its patronage, has enabled the church to portray the word of God in a more glorious way. But also the political power of the crown is increased by its spiritual depiction in these biblical illustrations. The notion of learning was further developed in the late 14th century, when the then Bishop William Wickham founded Winchester College. After the Black Plague had decimated the population, Wickham was dismayed at the standard of new recruits entering the church's ministry. He established two places of learning, primarily for young priests. One was New College Oxford, the other Winchester College. Winchester was unique for it was the first time that scholarships were offered. There are still places for 70 scholars, although the admission process has altered slightly. Since 1857, there's been a competitive examination. Before that, a scholar merely had to prove to have a wealthy patron. Remarkably simple, when you consider that the scholarship ensured automatic admission to New College, Oxford, and essentially, security for life. Winchester College was established by a royal charter in October 1382 by Richard II. Amazingly, it is still using many of its original buildings which are at least 600 years old and has the longest continuous history of any school in the country. One of the longest written accounts of English history is contained in a remarkable collection of books known as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Of all Alfred's accomplishments, this history of the Kingdom of Wessex, which he commissioned, must be his greatest surviving legacy. The Chronicle provides us with an amazing year-by-year -year account of Alfred's and his successors' reigns, right up until the Norman invasion. Edward the Confessor's long and largely uneventful reign was later regarded with nostalgia. Yet his only real achievement was the construction of what became known as Westminster Abbey, which is where he was buried. Little did he know it was to change the fortunes of Winchester irreparably. His greatest crime, though, was to leave the matter of succession undecided. He was married, but with no children. 
His death in January 1066 was to set in motion a struggle for the English crown that was to change the course of this land's history forever. In September 1066, William, Duke of Normandy, later nicknamed the Conqueror, landed at Pevensey Bay. William disputed King Harold's right to the throne and claimed that Edward had promised him the crown. The Battle of Hastings was to ultimately determine the fate of both the crown and the country. Then on Christmas Day 1066, William symbolically held his coronation in Edward the Confessor's recently completed Westminster Abbey. It was the beginning of the transference of power from the ancient Saxon capital of Winchester to the new Norman one of London. As Winchester's status changed through the Middle Ages, so did the city. Its economy suffered, much of its Saxon heritage disappeared, and then in 1642, disaster struck. The outbreak of the Civil War divided the city's loyalties between the King, Charles I, and Parliament. But it was the latter's roundhead soldiers who did the most damage. They looted the city and cathedral not once, but twice. And then in September 1645, from the area known as Oliver's Battery, they turned their guns on the castle and pounded it for a week. Oliver Cromwell declared that Winchester Castle should never again pose a threat and its remaining fortifications were torn down. Only the Great Hall survived. With only the Norman Cathedral and Plantagenet Great Hall left standing, it would seem that Winchester has been purged of its ancient past. Yet there is something here that opens up another world, a life beyond King Alfred, where fact meets fiction, the Round Table. No one seems to know just how it came to be here, but everyone associates it with and can't help to be inspired by the story of King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. If he existed at all, he would have lived in the 6th century and he helped to basically weld together a number of feuding Celtic tribes to uh, organize an opposition to the invading Saxons. So in fact, he's a very important figure for that reason. Um, no one really knows about his death. He disappears under mysterious circumstances. And right from that moment onward, people were saying that this man, Arthur, will come back. Arthur will come back to help us in our time of need. And I think this became the beginning of the romantic legend. From the Middle Ages onward, um, there's been a very strong association, which still exists to this day, um, that this was the original, in some way connected to the original round table, that this was the original Camelot. This round table here, of course, is not the round table. This is a, a medieval copy, um, possibly made for Edward I. It was painted by, at the, at the command of Henry VIII, um, for the visit of, a, of the Emperor Charles V and um, he, he, he desired to have it painted to capture the whole idea and spirit of Arthurian chivalry. But of course, the figure of Arthur is in fact Henry himself. Henry probably inherited this fascination with Arthur from his father. Henry's father was Henry VII, but his claim to the English throne was tenuous beyond belief. So he used the magic of the Arthurian legend to assist his position and image. Henry named his elder son Arthur and had him christened here at Winchester Cathedral. Arthur died before he became king, but his widow Catherine of Aragon married his brother and he later became Henry VIII. When Henry VIII had the table painted in 1522, it was to impress the new Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Henry had high hopes of securing the position of Holy Roman Emperor for himself and wanted to suggest to Charles that his lineage could be traced as far back as the legendary hero Arthur and all he stood for. Where better then to bring him than Winchester? Trying to prove that your lineage or family history is longer than someone else's is a practice which continues to this day. Britain is lucky to have such a rich, varied and relatively well-documented past, much of it encapsulated in this city of Winchester, the capital of the ancient kingdom of Wessex, 
and the former capital of England. <laughs>